Today, like I said, we begin a brand new series called Summer Mixtape, and we're really excited about it. If you're brand new to Christ's Covenant, just to kind of let you know what we do each summer, we know people, you're going to be here one week, gone another week. We got people that are already on vacation out of town, and so what we like to do is we like to pick either a topic or a book in the Bible and go through it the entire summer. And so it's one of our longer series every single summer. And we've done a series in the summer called Summer Fruit, a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And and we've gone through books and all that kind of stuff. And today is going to be one of those summer series where we go through an entire book in the Bible, not every single chapter, but moving our way through. And that's the book of Psalms. And so if you got a copy of God's Word, why don't you go ahead and turn there. We're going to start in the first chapter. And really, we're going to go on a summer road trip, okay? And so if you're not here for one of the services in person, check it out online. But Psalms is an incredible book. And during this series, we're going to look at some of the greatest hits, those that you know, but also some of the deep cuts, maybe some psalms that you aren't so familiar with. And really, if you don't know anything about the book of Psalms, it is a book of songs. Really, it's an album of 150 songs, and it's incredible. You could even say it this way, that the book of Psalms, it is a prayer playlist set to music. That's really what it is. And there's all different types of prayers, all different types of songs, really different songs, different prayers for different occasions. And how many of y'all know, like if you've got a good summer mixtape, like you're going to take a road trip and you've got a playlist of songs, like it's good to have some variety, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like not just the same kind of songs. Why? Because you're going to get sick of it. In fact, if, if, if you got young kids like my wife and I or, or the grandparents in the room online and maybe you got young grandkids, if you've ever been on a road trip with young kids, you know this. There's only so much of Cocoa Melon and Baby Shark that you can handle. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just thank God right now that you don't know what I'm talking about, okay? And so you need like some variety, right? You need different genres, different types of music. Variety is a really good thing. And we see that in the book of Psalms. And and honestly, I think one of the reasons why we love this book so much, and you probably have Psalm 23 memorized, different Psalms are your favorite if you've grown up in church. I think one of the reasons why we love this book so much is because we can relate to it. Like there's songs when when you're feeling really sad that you can go to to encourage you. There's songs where the writer of that song, they, they they're, they're mad, they're, they're, they're angry, or they're confused, and we've all had that in different seasons of our life. There's also psalms or songs that, that man, they're perfect for that, that mountaintop moment where you can celebrate and get your praise dance on. I mean, there's psalms for every different occasion. There's a great variety, but not just the genres or the types of songs. There's also variety when it comes to the author, the composer of these psalms. There's at least seven different authors when it comes to the 150 psalms in this book. Now, you're familiar with David probably if you've grown up in church, and he wrote most of them, but not all of them. And the whole book, starting in Psalm 1, where we'll be today, going through Psalm 150. The entire book, many people don't know this, it covers a span of about 1,000 years. So there's a lot there. It's an incredible, incredible book. Not to mention, you've got the longest chapter in the Bible, chapter 119 of Psalm, and then you've also got the shortest chapter, just two verses, Psalm 117. And even as you look to Jesus, How many of y'all know we're all about Jesus, right? And as you look to Jesus, the book of Psalms is his most quoted Old Testament book. So the book of Psalms was very important to Jesus. He quotes it 11 times in the New Testament. And so we want to jump right in. Let's start our road trip together. Psalm chapter 1. If you're not there yet, just give on up, okay? We'll have the words on the screen. But Psalm chapter 1, and while you're at it, grab something to take notes as well. Here's what it says. I'm going to read out the NIV, and we're going to read all six verses because you can handle it. And here's what what it says. Blessed or blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight 
is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person, someone shout that person. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Verse six, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. For those taking notes, I'm calling this first message in our summer series, Theme Song, because that's what chapter one is, by the way. It is the theme song to the entire book of Psalms. If you get this chapter, you'll understand better the rest of the book. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you so much and so grateful for these moments together in your presence with your people. So grateful for what you're doing in your church. And we pray God today for every single one of us, the first timer, those here for the first time in a long time, or even those that are here almost every single week, I pray God for all of us that we would lean in, even if we know the book of Psalms very well, even if we know chapter one very well, even if we haven't memorized, I pray God that we would lean in and the Holy Spirit, that you would speak something fresh to us. Maybe something that I don't even plan to say, but as you, as you move and as you operate during this message that I would say it because they need it, God, or maybe it's something that I don't even say, but something I do say takes them on a journey in their mind to what they really need to hear. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak whatever you wanna speak, that you would have your way in your people as we lean into your holy word and have some fun while we're doing it. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, um, if you ask people on the street this question, like, what do you want most in life? So you went up to random people today after the service and you asked them that question. What do you want most in life? I think at least nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, would give you the same answer. And here's the answer I think they would give you. And here's the answer I think you would probably give me. I just want to be happy right? That's the question of the day. Well, I don't want much in life. I just want to be happy. Well, you know what? I don't want much in life. I just want my kids to be happy or my grandkids to be happy. Happy, happy, happy. You know what I'm saying? That would be the answer for most people. And here's what's interesting about that is even though many of us, if not all of us would say, hey, I, I, I want to be happy. The case is that most people are not happy that they, they they want it that their whole life is built around that idea but it's it's elusive right like they, they can't get to it. in fact i'll prove it to you a recent study a recent poll said said this here's what they found out that and this was taken not too long ago but only 14 percent of americans say they're very happy only 14 percent and many of you are like yep yeah, i'm not very happy right now either so i'm in i'm in that that boat. And so we want happiness. We've got that pursuit of happiness, right, that we have, but we're not getting it. And so this all leads to the obvious question, really the question of the day. How do you find happiness then? If we want it, if we desire it, but we can't get to it right now, how do we find happiness? And some people think, and maybe this is you, some people think that the answer is to buy something new, right? Like, like, if, like we wouldn't maybe say that, but we live that way. Like if I just buy something new on Amazon, one day shipping for most of my purchases, incredible. If I could just get that, that new car, then I would be happy. How many of y'all know what's happening in the housing market right now? If I could just get that new house in that neighborhood, then we'd be happy, right? If I, you know what, if I just get some new clothes, then I'll be happy. You know what, if I get that new piece of technology, yeah, it's gonna be outdated the second that I buy it, but still, if I can just get that new thing, that new phone, that new laptop, that new iPad, whatever, then I'll be happy. Other people, they think that happiness comes from how you look, right? Many people, when they look at themselves in the mirror, they don't like the person 
looking back at them. And so many people think, well, if I can just lose weight, then I'll be happy. If I can just have more hair here, guys, you know what I'm talking about, than hair in other places, then I'd be happy. Like, 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 like if I could just have more definition instead of flap when I wave my arms, then I'd be happy, right? Like we think it's the way that we, we look. <laughs> other people think that it's, it's from relationships, right? Oh man, if I could just marry that person, woo, then I'd be happy. For other people, and you better not amen this, you're like, hey, if I could just not be married to this person anymore, then I'd be happy. Eyes forward, eyes forward. <laughs> some of y'all laughed way too hard a second ago. You're gonna need some marriage counseling after the sermon today. But like, how, how do you find happiness? Because we're trying all these different things, and let's just be honest, they're not working. And here's what's so interesting about this, okay? Hang with me. Here's what's so fascinating to me. When you read the very first word, in the very first psalm, it's the word blessed or blessed. Did you know when you do the research, when you do the study, the better word here, the proper word is actually the word happy. And so here's how the psalm should read with the original language, the original intent, original context. Happy is the one who. That's how it should start. Happy is the one who. And then it tells us how to be happy and so really the title theme song is not good enough like like the message is always going to be really good by the way when I can't just come up with one title there's also like a second title a subtitle and so today's message is going to be real good it's theme song and then the subtitle is this if you're taking notes the secret to happiness the secret to happiness so let's lean in together let's have some fun and let's grow as we walk through verse by verse this incredible psalm here, here's the first thing you need to know. You see, happy people are, number one, the Bible tells us, careful with their company. I don't know if that jumped off the page to you, but that's the, that's the first verse. It's what it's all about. Happy people, if you wanna be happy, and if you don't, like, you got some issues, right? Everybody wants to be happy. And so if you wanna be happy, the Bible tells us right from verse one that you've gotta be careful with the company you keep. And so make this personal. Can I remind you of something? This message isn't for anybody else. It's for you, okay? No, 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 you, you don't know my, 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 my spouse. Oh, you don't know my kids. I, I, I may not, but it's for you, okay? It's not for them. It's not for that person you wish was not on vacation this week so they could hear this and get their act together. It's for you, okay? You don't need to send this message to your second uncle removed because, you know, like Christmas is real awkward around. Maybe send it to him, but it's for you, okay? Like, it's for you. Are you careful with the company you keep? Are you surrounding yourself with the right people? I'm talking about your inner circle. I'm talking about those that are closest to you. Please hear me loud and clear. I'll say it again and again and again during my messages. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's not just for teenagers, not just for young adults, not just for, uh, like it's for everybody, friend. Show me your friends your closest friends, and I'll show you your future. You're becoming an average of your five closest friends. And so if your closest friends are not going after Jesus, it's no surprise that you're struggling in your relationship with Jesus. If all of your friends and closest contacts are pulling you away from Jesus and you're questioning your faith, you should not be so confused as to why that's the case. It's not a church's fault or a pastor's fault or a ministry's fault. Like maybe it's the people that you have around you that you're listening to and you're hearing them, you're seeing what culture says and all of this, and that's what's causing you to question your faith. Can I tell you something? Your relationships are not just physical. They're not just emotional. They are spiritual. Can I get an amen in God's house? They're spiritual. And really, there's two types of people. There really is. People that are drawing you closer to Jesus because of their walk with Jesus or people that are causing you to drift away from Jesus. There's two categories. And I'm not saying that all your friends need to be believers. I've preached on that many times. Like you need to have influence in people's lives, people that don't know Jesus. But the people closest to you, the company that you keep, people around you, people speaking into your life, they should be on fire for Jesus. They should encourage you in your walk with Jesus because of how on fire that they are. And the author of Psalm 1, this is one of those psalms we don't really know. It's kind of anonymous. But the author here, the writer, the composer, 
breaks down how to be careful with your company. Like, like it's not rocket science. I love that the word of God is practical. That, that, that you can look at it and read and not just be inspired, but to have takeaways, right? That you, I, I can take this away with me the rest of the day, the rest of the week, hopefully the rest of my life, and I can apply it to my life and it will help me practically. And so really there's three ways, A, B, and C, if you're taking notes, that you can be careful with your company. And again, this is all verse one, extremely practical. Here, here's the first way practically, letter A, don't walk with the wicked. That's what it says. We just read it. Don't walk with the wicked. Well, what in the world does that mean, pastor? It means this. The world's ways, they don't work. If you don't believe me, try it. It, it, it don't work. It doesn't work. And so the Bible says here, the author says, don't walk with the wicked. The world's ways, they don't work. Letter B is this. The Bible also says in verse one, don't stand like sinners. So you don't walk with the wicked, practically, how you are careful with your company that you keep, but also don't stand like sinners. Well, what does that mean, pastor? It means this. Sin is sugar-coated, but it's rotten in the middle. There is no substance to sin. Like, can we just be real? Like, we're in God's house. Like, like sin is fun for a season, right? Like, like, it's just the truth. If it wasn't fun, it wouldn't be enticing. Like, don't act like you're holier than me, okay? Like, 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 for real. If you're like, no, sin is not fun, well, then you weren't doing it right, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> I just made somebody so mad right now. So mad. <laughs> I just snorted. All right. <laughs> just caught the Holy Ghost if you were here last week. All right, here we go. Don't stand like sinners. And so, so sin, it's, it's enticing, the Bible says, right? That's, that's why it's, it's tempting. It's the bait on the hook. But when we bite the bait, we also bite into the hook, right? And so, so it's no substance there. It's fun for a season, but it won't last. That's why you got to get drunk again. That's why you got to go to another relationship again, right? Like the substance abuse, whatever it is, pills, whatever, whatever the sin is, you just need more and more and more because it doesn't satisfy. And here's letter C, very practical. Don't sit with scorners. And this is going to hit somebody real hard. And we've been talking about this a lot lately as we've been walking through the Bible together. What's that mean? It means this. Don't be a critic. Like, like, like don't be a critic. Don't be that armchair quarterback that's telling everybody else who's actually like involved in ministry, actually getting their hands dirty, helping people. Don't be the person, the hero behind the keyboard, the armchair quarterback that just watches everybody else in the action and says, you should have done it this way. You should have done it that way. No, you do something, okay? You be the change you want to see in the world. Don't be a critic. And so very, very practical ways that we can be careful with the company that we keep. And so here's your homework right from the beginning. Well, it's summer. Why do we have homework in the summer? I'm just sorry. It is what it is. But here's your homework to look at your close relationships, not because you're holier than thou, but to make sure the people you have around you, the people that are impacting your life, that they're running after Jesus that they're encouraging you in your walk with Jesus, that, that they're glass half full kind of people. Like anybody can be a critic, anybody can point out the bad stuff that's happening, but that people that are looking for the good. Can I get an amen? Here's the second point. Happy people, number two, and I'll have to explain this one, but I think it's a real good point. Number two is this, happy people eat the book. They eat the book. This is verse two. If you got the Bible open, I encourage you to keep it open as we walk through verse by verse. But happy people eat the book. Well, what in the world does that mean, pastor? It means this. If you look at verse two, it says that happy people delight in God's law. Now, in their context, it was the first five books of the Bible. In our context, we have the entire canon of scripture. So it's the word of God. And the Bible says in verse two, this anonymous author of Psalm one, that happy people, they, they delight in God's law. They delight in God's word. The holy word of God, can I tell you, friend, it is an incredible meal. Incredible. 
Like, like I, I know when you look at it from the outside, you're like, I, I don't, no, 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 no. It is an incredible meal. It is not an antiquated book with just a couple of, you know, good ideas. No, 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 no. This is the holy word of God, the perfect word of God. I should get some better amens in the house. We are thankful for this book. It is the good book. This is everything that you need to function and operate here on earth. You want to hear the word of God. What does God sound like? Read the Bible out loud, friend. The holy word of God. It's an, it's an incredible meal. And the reason why I use that, that, that imagery, eat the book and talking about the Bible as a meal, is because that's the imagery seen in the original context. Look at verse two again. What's it say? Not only do happy people delight in the word of God, but it says this, they meditate on the word of God day and night. And can I tell you something? Biblical meditation is not you crossing your arms and your legs and doing this and going, mm, that, that, that's not biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is you chewing on the word of God. That's actually what the original word, meditate, that's the imagery that it brings up. It's almost like a cow chewing the cud. Like that's the idea, the imagery, that I am devouring the word of God, that I'm taking it in. How many of y'all know, like when you enjoy a good meal, there is nothing like it, right? Like, like you, you're taking your time, you look forward to the meal, you're telling all your friends about that incredible meal afterwards. And not only that, as your body is taking in an incredible meal, what else is happening? Your body is absorbing the nutrients. Your body is getting better because of the meal. And I got to tell you, the holy word of God, this is not some like ramen noodles that you had in college that you used to live on. This is filet mignon, y'all. This is lobster crab legs. This is mud bugs the size of your hand. This ain't kale. This ain't celery. This is an incredible meal. But here's my question. All of us are taking in meals. We're all full of something but I wonder, are you full, filled up with the word of God or are you full of something else? And I wanna illustrate that to you very, very simply. In fact, hopefully you can see this online as well. Real simple illustration. So for this illustration's sake here, this glass of vase or vase, whatever you wanna say, this is you and me. And then you've got this vase and then you've got some, some orange ping pong balls. So here's what happens in life, because remember, we're all full of something. The question is, what are we full of? And really, you could take it back to our childhood to find out what we're full of. In fact, these orange balls, they're, they're kind of like the, the mistakes of the past, the sin, culture, lies, stuff people say about us, just, just all of that is kind of what's represented here. So we have us, and Starting when we were young, maybe, and this happened to many of us, but maybe at some point in your childhood, you were bullied and you were made fun of and these things started filling up your life. And you're like an adult now, maybe you got grandkids now and still you can go back in your mind to how you were bullied on the playground or in your neighborhood, how you were made fun of. How many of y'all know kids are mean sometimes, right? Especially if your name rhymes with anything. Man, they'll just take it to you. And you had these things that happened to you as you were little and they've, they've stuck with you. Or maybe you, you grew up with just one mom or maybe just one parent or maybe no parents at all and you moved through the foster system and so you had these people that would belittle you or, or make fun of you or maybe you didn't have good role models and you can see that even at a young age, our lives start to get filled up with all of this junk. Like, am I, am I talking to anybody? Like, no one has perfect upbringings, right? Because people aren't perfect. So you got all this stuff and then you, and then you get a little bit older and peer pressure and everything that happens and the way that you look, it's a big deal to us. And, uh, you know, I had too much acne or I wish my nose was bigger or small. Well, no one probably wishes it big, bigger, but smaller, you know, or I wish my face looked this way. And we got all this stuff that comes, but then it continues on into adulthood. For many of us, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. I know so many people that they say things like this, man, I thought my life would look different at 30 than it does now. I thought my life would look different at 40 
than it does now. And we've got, oh man, we've, we've got this problem in our society, in our culture, and social media has made it so much worse, but it's this problem with comparison. And I can't be happy with what's in my hand because I'm worried about what's in everybody else's hand. Am I speaking truth today on a Sunday morning? And so we got all this junk. And then what do we do? I talked about it earlier. We go to relationships or we go to our job to try to get fulfillment, right? Well, if I can make more money or get the raise or get the better this or the better that and we fill up our lives with all of this junk and it's filled to the very very top and really we look at our lives and we're like I don't know how I got here and I'm telling you the way that you got here is that you're full of the wrong stuff but remember what we've been talking about with point number two the word of God that we would meditate on it, we would devour it, that day and night we're thinking about it, we're applying the word to our lives. We're not just reading the word, asking the word to read us. Your, your, your mission on a Sunday morning is not, oh, make me feel better, pastor, or tell me something new. It's Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me that I can live out the rest of my life? What are you full of? And so not only is like the word of God um, an incredible meal, but it's also so living water. And so, so Pastor Dante, would you help a brother out here? I got some living water. Give it up for Pastor Dante in the house. Awesome. We've got living water here. And so here's what you need to do today. Today, not tomorrow, not next week. Don't wait till the new year. Today is you've got to consistently fill up your life with the Lord. You've got to consistently fill up your life with the word. I'm not talking 85 verses every single day, 18 chapters a day. I'm not talking about that. If you got young kids like us, that ain't even realistic, okay? Like three seconds of silence is an incredible miracle. You know what I'm talking about? And so I'm not talking about time. I'm talking about consistency, meditating on the word day and night. It's a consistent, it's a part of your life. And so today you start reading a verse a day and like, like you version Bible apps got a verse a day that you can read. Like that is plenty to get you started. And you start filling up your life with the living water. But here's what happens. I poured in a good amount of water so far, but you hadn't seen any change yet, have you? That happens all the time. Well, pastor, I'll give you a day. <laughs> I'll give you a week. You know, you really gave it your best today, and so I'm inspired, and so I'm going to give you some time. But you read for a day, you read for a week, and you don't see any change happen. Like, like maybe it's a little bit more juicy on Sundays, you know what I'm saying, but it's dry during the week. And you're like, it's not working. Can I tell you, anything worth doing is worth doing consistently. Can I get amen? And you got to start that spiritual discipline that spiritual habit. And so you keep going every single day, two minutes, five minutes, doesn't really matter. It's all about consistency. And you can see, oh, I'm making a mess. And you can see that as you have the living water pour in, like some of y'all, God's got to get people out of your life, you know, just get them away, you know? You can hold on to that. That's free. You keep it, AJ. <laughs> but but here's, here, here's what happens. You get started and you start to see some change as you stay consistent, but here's where many people stop. In fact, there's probably many in this room online that you stop here because here's what you say to yourself. Well, at least my life is better than it used to be. I'm half full. I'm mostly full. What's up, bud? Good to see you, man. He's like, I want a ping pong ball. Give me a ping pong ball. He can have one, bud. Here you go, right here. There you go. Awesome. Good man. I need to wear some light up shoes like he is, man. Some people watching online, they have no clue what's happening. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not even going to explain it. And so some of you start here or stop here. Like, like, like just halfway, oh, I'm just better than I used to be. And that's not what God has called you to. He wants to fill up every single area of your life. He wants to completely saturate you. He wants to fill you up so there is no room for anything else and you think the illustration's over but it's not over it's not over yet here's what I want you to see is not only 
Are we filled up now with the word of God? He has filled us up, his presence, life, vitality. We are, we are not malnourished like we used to be. Can I tell you, one hot meal on a Sunday morning is not, to get, not enough to get you through the week. You will be malnourished. And so as we are filled up with the word of God to overflowing, here's what takes place. And it's so incredible. Don't miss this, okay? Whenever the world's ways or different influences, whenever they try to come in and infiltrate our lives, what happens? It floats back to the surface. Nothing can penetrate us any longer. Why? Because we are so filled up with the word of God. You're all full of something. The question of the day is, what are you full of? And if you don't like what's coming out of you, maybe you need to check what's coming into you. Here's the third point, lastly. If you want to be happy, which I know you do, if you want to be blessed by God, not only do you have to be careful with the company you keep, that's verse one, not only do you need to eat the book to, to meditate on the word of God, to apply the word of God to your life. That's number two. And if you do both those things, what do we find out in verse three? Then and only then can you be evergreen. When you're careful with your company, this ain't my personal opinion, by the way. This is straight up scripture, verse by verse, walking through together. When you're careful with your company, when you eat the book, then and only then can you be ever green. And this is, this is incredible. I love what we see in verse three, but also the comparison between verse three and verses four through five. If you got it open, check it out with me as we're walking through this. You've got this comparison of an evergreen tree versus dried up chaff. So we see verse three and then verses four through five. And you know what evergreen is. I mean, we got a lot of that here in Houston because it rains about every 20 seconds, right? Like just constantly. I, by the way, this is not in my message, but I've had such a horrible attitude with all this rain like the last months. Y'all pray for me, man, this, this horrible attitude. But like, like it rains a lot and that's why it's so green, right? And so you know what evergreen is, but a lot of people don't know what, what chaff is. And if you look to the, the biblical context, of course, it's still true today, but, but chaff is, is the outside of a grain of wheat. And so what they would do in the biblical context is, is they would throw up the wheat in the air and the wind would blow away the outer shell, the chaff. And the chaff would literally just dry it up, just would, would blow on away, and then they'd be left with the grain that you can make bread with. So you've got it. This comparison, an evergreen tree, which we all want to be, and dried up chaff. And I just think this is beautiful imagery. I love the word of God. I'm so thankful. You see, when you have an evergreen tree, when you're evergreen, you bear fruit in every season. When you're evergreen, you are impervious to drought. But then on the flip side of the coin, when you're chaff, you're, you're, you're dried up. And if everybody tried to, like if you ever tried to eat chaff, it's bitter, ain't good for anybody. You've got an evergreen with roots down deep. Evergreens are not potted plants, by the way. Evergreens, they are planted in one place connected to God. But then you have chaff that has no substance, that has no root. You got an evergreen, that can weather the storms of life. And I know you want this. I want this. Doesn't matter what hits an evergreen, it's gonna last. There's, there's legacy, there's security, but chaff, it is useless. It is blown away, remember no more. The composer here, the psalmist, the writer, the author, being led by the Holy Spirit, they give us this beautiful picture of an evergreen, versus dried up, useless, rootless chaff. And then you get to the last verse where we'll end today. And verse six is so clear. Like you don't need a Bible commentary to understand verse six, but if you read the Bible commentaries, they back up what you can see so clearly. Verse six, after everything we've talked about so far today, 
says this, there are two paths that you can take. There's two options. I don't know if y'all remember these books back in the day, the choose your own adventure books. And if you, you came up like on a, on a cliff, it could say, hey, you dive into the water or you can go the long way back around. And then if you dive into the water underneath you, then you go to like page 55. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? If you go the other route, you turn to this page and it's a choose your own adventure. There's a choice the Bible says clearly here. So today you're gonna have to leave making one of these choices. The first choice is towards Jesus. It's the right path. Jesus says this, like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. That's the path I want you to choose. It's the path God wants you to choose, but it's your choice. I can't choose it for you. You can choose that one, or you can choose the world's ways. Can I, can I tell you something that, that was so profound for me as I was studying earlier this week, what I came across? You see, the key to true happiness is it's not a direct pursuit. It's a byproduct of another pursuit, running after Jesus. If you chase happiness or chase paper or chase this promotion, all this kind of stuff, it's gonna leave you unfulfilled, unsatisfied. But if you chase after Jesus, you'll realize, man, why did it take me so long to go after him? We don't pursue happiness, we pursue him, and then he brings the blessing, he brings the happiness. But you got a choice, choose your own adventure. Will you go your way, the world's way, or will you go God's way? Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray for my friends. God, as we've looked through verse by verse, this incredible psalm, the, the theme song for all 150. God, I pray that, that maybe you'd highlight a point, maybe two points, maybe even something I didn't say for everyone. Maybe there's somebody here that, that you have not been careful with the company that you keep that you've been surrounding yourself, your, your close friends with people who don't follow Jesus. And you're wondering, why am I struggling in my faith? And the answer is maybe just the company that you're keeping. Keep those friendships, but those that are closest to you, they need to be on fire for God, encouraging you in your faith. Maybe for others, the Holy Spirit's highlighting point number two. Man, I need, I need to eat the book. I need to need to consistently be in God's word, even if it's just a verse a day. I, I gotta find a good devotional or I pray God that you would help us to, to act in obedience, to meditate on your word, to think on it and better than anything else to apply it to our lives. I don't care if they've got a million verses memorized, if they're not living them out, what's the point? God, help us to live out your word. We're all full of something, but to be filled up with your presence, filled up with your word. And as we do that, we'll see all those other things from our childhood, from adulthood to begin to filter out. And I pray God for those in the room, and I know it's probably everyone, that they wanna be evergreen. They wanna bear fruit in every season. They wanna have a deep root system, not a potted plant moving around. They wanna thrive, they wanna leave a legacy here on earth that far surpasses their time on earth. I pray God we realize that the only way that we do that is being connected to you. You're the one that brings strength, you're the one that brings vitality. And I pray more than anything else, Jesus, we would pursue you, that we would run after you, not chasing happiness or momentary things, but to run after you. And I pray lastly for anybody underneath the sound of my voice that's far from you, I pray that today they would make a decision, a choice to choose you, to stop living life their way, but to run after you, to give you their life, to surrender all, to make you their personal Lord and Savior. And if that's you, friend, in the room online, you can do that right now and choose Jesus. Can I tell you, he, He's already chosen you. He wants to save you. The question is, will you choose him? 
And if you want to do that right now, or maybe even want to make a fresh commitment, you can do that. Don't delay. So in the room online, I'll give you some words that you can whisper, that you can say to Jesus. You need to know that, that he hears you, that he loves you, and that he will answer this prayer. But if you're wanting to surrender your life to Jesus, you just tell him right now, Jesus, just whisper to him, Jesus, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for restoring me right now. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. And so I make you my personal Lord and Savior. You're God, you're real. I ask you right now to forgive me of all my sin, to clean me up, to make me new. I realize that that I can't fix myself. I realize I can't save myself. I I realize that, that, that I need a savior. So I ask you to be my savior, to be my friend, to help me from this day forward to live for you in a culture that is so far and even against you, God, to help me with boldness to live my life for you. Thank you for saving my soul, for setting me free. Thank you for filling me up. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCub.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, We want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCove.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at ChristCoveHouston.